Oh, okay, we're live. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Morgan, and I'm the Director for Community Engagement in the Diversity Programs Office here at James West in the UCLA Alumni Affairs Office. And uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us for the first Empower Hour of 2018. Um, and also the first in a series that we're going to do this year on parenting in the 21st century. Empower Hour is a one hour online program that explores culturally re relevant discussions on the themes of diversity that benefit all people trying to navigate a changing world. Uh, today, uh, we have the topic on uh, the ongoing dilemma, raising African-American male leaders in an atmosphere of conflict. Our special guest today is Professor Tyrone Howard, Howard, who is a professor of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. He is also the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Professor Howard's research examines culture, race, teaching, and learning. He has published over 80 peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and technical reports. He's published several best-selling books, among them, Why Race and Culture Matters in Schools, and Black Males, Peril and Promise in the Education of African American Males. His most recent book, Expanding College Access for Urban Youth, documents ways schools and colleges can create higher education opportunities for youth of color. Dr. Howard is also the director and founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA, which is an interdisciplinary cadre of scholars, practitioners, and community members, as well as policy members, makers dedicated to improving the educational experiences and life chances of Black males and other males of color. So thank you for being with us today. Thanks Dr. for having Howard. me. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Um, we've had a number of conversations around this, this topic over coffee mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. croissants and any number of other <laughs> things. Um, and we, we think that this is a particularly challenging time for, mm -hmm. for raising children in general. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to start um, by asking you if you can talk about the social political context in which we're raising young African American men in now, and how's that changed over the past 20 to 30 years? Yeah, so I think we always have to understand the importance of the moment we live in because context matters. And I think at this moment, we're living in a very unique set of circumstances. I think with the current administration, it's created certain degrees of hostility towards, towards certain populations. And even before this current administration, uh, we had this rash of violent shootings of unarmed black men at the hands of law enforcement officials. And even still, currently we've gotten some cases that haven't gotten as much attention, but they're still happening. So this social political moment that we're in still is one wherein black men are oftentimes seen as public enemy number one. They're targeted. They're oftentimes assumed to be guilty, and then they're questioned after the fact. Sadly, some young men don't have that opportunity to respond to those questions when their lives are taken away from them. So this is the moment we live in where we're having to be very, very uh, explicit with our young men about how they must understand surroundings, how they must understand their presence, how they must understand the kinds of thinking that, that exists in our society about how others see them. Uh, and I think we live in a time where they have to be constantly on alert, even as young as 10, 11, 12 years old, to understand that they are not seen the same way as perhaps their peers who are non-Black are. And so then the question becomes, how is this different than before? And I think it's different before because in many ways it's, it's become almost sanctioned, right? It, it's become almost okay, acceptable. You know, it pains me. David, every time I hear or I saw one of these shootings of an unarmed black man, the, the, just the response back about, you know, if he only had not done X, if he had only not done Y, if he had taken more steps to it. So it's always a situation where we blame the victim, but never stop to think about the circumstances that could have perhaps prevented or avoided those situations altogether. It dates back to Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice. Uh, you know, Eric Garner, the list goes on and on and on. So I think what we have to recognize now is that as much as we like to say we're in this post-racial moment, bottom line, race still matters. From an educational point um, standpoint, what are some of the challenges that this has raised for you as a father and an educator? Um, and how has it influenced your approach to teaching, training, and 
in your case also as a father mm -hmm. rearing mm -hmm. young men. Yeah, so having three sons of my own, part of it is is having those conversations with them like I know you've had with your sons about being mindful of your surroundings at all times, understanding how to engage with uh, law enforcement, knowing the do's and don'ts, all those kinds of things continue to be at the forefront of how I engage with my own young men. But even when it comes to my teaching, I oftentimes take an approach that my teaching, the young men I teach here, is no different than how I see my own sons. And so I have conversations with these young men here at UCLA, not just about content, but also about their health and well-being and their safety and their protection and just being vigilant about the ways in which they interact, not only in this space, but also in the wider community here in Los Angeles. Because uh, I always try to remind them that just because you're a student at UCLA, it does not mean that you're immune from some of the, the toxic stressors and some of the, the, the nastiness that exists in society about who they are as black men. So for me, it's about making sure I teach to them holistically and that holistic development speaks to not only their academic and cognitive development, but also their cultural, their psychological, their physiological, uh, and spiritual well-being as well. Tell us how the Black Male Initiative at UCLA came about, and um, what are some of the outcomes that you've seen, or what were some of the challenges mm -hmm. around putting that program together? And what have been some of the outcomes that you've seen as a result of that? Right. So the, the, the Black Male Institute came together uh, around 2010, and it really started because there was this ongoing need that I continue to experience on this campus where, A, there weren't very many black men on the campus. Um, the small numbers that were here struggled in terms of fitting and oftentimes having this sense of, do I belong here? Uh, and then feeling like they didn't have any sense of community. And I had a number of what I call almost one-on-one -on -one therapy sessions in my office with young black man after young black man trying to figure out you know, how they make sense out of this place called UCLA. And so it became clear to me there was a need for a space. It became clear for me that there was a need for a, a way to engage them in larger numbers so that they could feel like they weren't alone. But I couldn't do it from the standpoint of just having us come together to talk. It needed to be centered and structured around uh, our ideas, our work, uh, our postgraduate plans in some kind of way. And so, you know, here we are, you know, going on almost, what, nine years later, and the work still happens. And one of the big outcomes I'm most proud of is one of the things that we did. We created a, a first-year African-American male course that they termed Black Amated, acclimating to the campus of UCLA for Black men. And it's been a real success because the young men who have participated in that class do much better academically, uh, do much better socially and emotionally compared to those young men who don't take the class. And when we do the, the data that we collect around that, we try to figure out what is it that makes a difference. Uh, a, they're within a community of other young men who look like them. B, they are able to, to, to be vulnerable and talk about the issues that are most important to them. But C, the focus remains steadfast on graduation and life beyond graduation at UCLA. So those are the things that we are really proud of, the fact that you know over 92, 93% of the young men who take the course uh, ultimately graduate within a six-year window. Uh, and they tend to report having a better overall experience as well. So again, for me, the goals are being object, uh, are being achieved. It's about making a space where young black men do not feel otherwise, but feel like they are also welcome here at UCLA. So I'm, I've, I've observed that on our campus, of course, you have a wide range of people and opinions. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, part of what these students encounter are certainly stereotypes. Yes. Um, that stereotypes that see a black male on UCLA's mm -hmm. campus, um, a lot of people automatically think he's African, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Which is, you know, in many cases not true. Right. Um, and there are other types of, of stereotypes that are perpetuated because of um, the media and mm -hmm. in particular social media, which is like really immediate um, and, and that impacts not only uh, perspective views of, of people but also can impact people's sense of safety mm -hmm. can you can you speak to how the students talk about that what are some of the things that students share and mm -hmm. their feelings yeah. and who you've included in your group mm -hmm. to kind of address those issues here at ucla yeah so I, so you're spot on with this one of the things that really saddens me and disappoints me is when i talk to a, a number of the young black men on this campus and they talk about the persistent racial microaggressions that they encounter on this campus uh, you must be on the football or basketball team uh, showing up in a chem lab well you must be in the wrong class 
Uh, being an engineering major, oh, somehow you must have gotten mixed up. How would you be in this engineering course? Uh, or in the, some, in, in the rare cases, and when we see them in leadership positions, even then, being questioned about why they're doing leadership, right? Are they most equipped to do that? So they hear these, 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 these comments that are slights on their intellect, that are slights on their ability, that are slights on their potential. And so what we have to do is, is then help them to counteract those microaggressions, right? And so part of what we do is we have to then shift to what I refer to as the microaffirmations. We have to affirm these young men, tell them that, look, to get into a place such as UCLA, you have to be incredibly, incredibly talented. You've got to be a hard worker, and you've got to have a whole lot of smarts and intellect. And so you have to remind them of these things to help them to understand that it was not an accident that they are here. Uh, nobody made a mistake that they were admitted, that they had a track record of 12, sometimes even 14 years of, of showing that they had the kind of intellectual depth and breadth to be successful here. So I'm always making it a point to try to bring in other black men that they can see who can give them further inspiration. So one of the big things I do in our program, I like to bring in lots of graduate students because the graduate students are black men who are not that far removed from where they are as undergraduate students. I think it's important for them to hear from the old heads like you and I, right? But they oftentimes think, oh, these dudes went to school in a whole nother century. They don't know what's going on in the 21st century. So by bringing in graduate students who are only some cases three, four, five years removed from where they are, I think it gives it a certain degree of, of cachet and relevancy because they're thinking, wow, I mean, here this young man is, he's pursuing an MBA and he's 26. Here this young man is, he's in law school and he's only 25. Here's another brother over here who's only 24 and he's pursuing a, a, a PhD. I think we found from the data that we collected, that's one of the most powerful things for these young men to see are individuals who look like them, who come from communities like theirs, but yet they're doing some amazing things in terms of their academic and professional pursuits. And then the beauty of it all is at the end of the day, they're just down to earth every day brothers. And that's what they really appreciate. So that, that, that message becomes clear. I don't have to give up any sense of my cultural integrity to be able to be successful academically. And that is that is huge for a lot of our young men to know that I can still listen to Jay-Z, I can still listen to Kendrick, just like these dudes do, and be, you know, this close from getting that MBA degree, or this close to getting a medical degree. And we are very intentional about them seeing young men who look like them, who are doing amazing things here on campus, but who aren't that far removed from being undergraduates. You kind of touched on something that comes up frequently, and that actually was one of the questions. That can, how do you address the issue of code switching? Yeah. I mean, I mean you know, it's it's interesting to see um, things that we've experienced mm -hmm, growing up mm -hmm, and that we mm -hmm, have mm -hmm, known mm -hmm. by virtue of our living that we mm -hmm, had to mm -hmm. do then become sociological constructs mm -hmm. and have a name mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and it goes back many, 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 many generations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how do you help students contextualize that? How do you yeah. help them with that? I think, I think you have to tackle it head on. And we do that. And when I talk to them collectively or when I talk to them individually, I always tell students, you are a walking brand. And that brand is going to help to either open up doors for you or it's going to close doors for you. But you have to be mindful of that. So the code switching part is something we've talked about on a number of occasions that you have to understand that there are a host of stereotypes that already exist about who you are as a black man. Now, when you say certain things or you engage in certain ways, all that does is reinforce the stereotype. Now, the question becomes, is that fair? No. Is that the reality? Absolutely. So we don't deal in the what should be world. We deal in the what is world. And so part of what we talk about is their professional demeanor of how you engage, of what you say, of how you say it. And it's not just with our words, Dave, as you know. I've had a number of conversations with young men about even how they dress mm -hmm. uh, because I believe my father was big on me about you got to dress for success, right? right? That you say a lot about yourself just based on your appearance before you open up your mouth to say one word. And so I know they see me, again, as the old head, and we got different ways in which doing things. I, I hear that, but I still, I come from the old school, and I think that it means something to walk into a situation. It can be a boardroom. It can be an admissions meeting. It can be a job interview. And the ways in which you dress and how you present yourself and how you speak carry significant weight to that brand. So part of what I tell these young men is that, look, I'm not saying that you have to abandon some of those ways of communicating. There's just a time and place for it. Uh, but also know that the time and space and place for other ways of engaging in a more professional manner are going to be required. One of the stereotypes about um, black men in general mm -hmm. that continues to persist 
and you know, I've talked about this also, mm -hmm. is the issue of the fatherless black home mm -hmm. um, and how that uh, either, uh, how that damages mm -hmm. uh, young black men growing up in terms of their pursuit of academics or acting out mm -hmm. and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a recent CDC study, mm -hmm. which was also um, supported by a Pew Foundation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. research report that indicates that um, actually there are more uh, black men in the home mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. than are outside of the home. Mm -hmm. And that even in those cases where, the, where men are not actually in the home, that black men continue to support mm -hmm. um, their mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. uh, at the same levels that other ethnic and uh, cultural groups do. Mm -hmm. Can you just kind of speak to that issue and, and yeah. the impact of, you know, fathers and That's right. yeah. or not having a father? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a product of having a father who was in my life from day one mm -hmm. and made all the difference in the world for me. And I can't think, I can't say how my life would be fundamentally different. Love my mother. My mother was amazing in terms of the upbringing of my brother and I. But my father being there was huge. It's the game changer, right? And so we, we operate from the standpoint, I think it's rooted in a historical narrative around black men. And you understand this just as well as I do, Dale. We've had this conversation. This historical narrative of black men as being shiftless or intellectually inept, uh, being wandering and uninvolved in the lives of their families, uh, not being able to be provided. I mean, this is, a, this is a narrative that's rooted back in slavery that really sort of spoke to the inferiority of black people and black men. Uh, for us to think that the remnants of those narratives still don't remain in place today, we'd be really, you know, overlooking something critical. And so you're right, there's all kind of data, both um, anecdotal data that you and I know from folks that we convene with, and just the larger research uh, sets of data that speak to the fact that black men are present, black men are involved, and they're not just involved from the standpoint of being breadwinners, black fathers are involved in terms of the emotional development of their sons, the spiritual development of their sons, the psychological development of their sons, and daughters, I might add you. And I think we've got to find a way to, to reframe that narrative. And I think one of the ways we reframe that narrative is we have to put the spotlight on those, those black men who are doing amazing jobs. I met a brother just a couple months ago. He was a single dad raising his eight children uh, on his own, uh, not looking for praise, not looking for any you know, accolades, just doing what needed to be done. And I just think that we as social scientists, we as folks who study these kinds of issues have got to do a better job of helping to rewrite that narrative, uh, of redeveloping that narrative that speaks to the, the, kind of, the kind of fathers that you are, the kind of father that I attempt to be. And, and many of the folks, if not all the, the men in our circles are doing the same thing. We're doing it well, we're doing it to the best of our ability. And I think it makes a difference. And I think somehow, some way, that, that narrative has escaped the national landscape in terms of black men and our roles as fathers. Uh, and even when you don't have fathers who are with mothers, again, uh, it doesn't mean that fathers are not involved in the lives of children, right? And part of the, the concern comes from this, that, this old tire stat that's thrown out, the number of black children who are born out of wedlock. And I think, in, you know, sort of inherent in that message, if a child is born out of wedlock, that must mean the father's not involved in his or her life. Uh, and that's not the case, right? I mean, there are lots of children who continue to see and have regular, healthy, sustained relationships with their fathers, even if parents are not together. So I just think we've got to we got to keep on refuting that one over and over again because it does lots of damage to how the black family is seen and how black men are seen in particular. I really appreciate your your sharing those insights with us. And um, for those of you who are participating in this uh, this cast. Um, we had the opportunity to look at some of your questions um, that you would like to have answered today. And um, we kind of broke them down into different sections. We broke them down into questions about the environment. Um, we, of course, uh, questions about parenting, uh, questions about uh, uh, preparation, and then some questions about support um, and support, supporting both students and parents. So it's okay, I'd like to just kind of transition um, to that. Um, one of the first questions that, uh, that came up, and you know, this, I, think, uh, I think this speaks to the issue of how we have become more socially mobile mm -hmm. in some ways. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know when I was very young, and I grew up, I grew up in a relatively small town, but mm -hmm. um, I grew up on a side of town that was predominantly black. Mm -hmm. Um, the school that I went to, although it wasn't predominantly black, there was a 
a huge influence in terms of the black community there. Mm -hmm. uh, as as people have uh, uh, had better jobs and had more economic mm -hmm. opportunities, mm -hmm. we've kind of moved away from right. the village, yeah. so to speak, yeah. and yeah. that becomes increasingly challenged. So one of the questions was, um, what are some of the best approaches for children who are in private schools mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where there's a little diversity um, where we can encourage their pride in African American culture without mm -hmm. alienating them mm -hmm. or the clubs mm -hmm. or the churches or discussions and um, where if we push too hard, mm -hmm. and I talk about this, if we push too hard, it kind of creates an awkwardness both with the child yeah. and with the environment. Yeah, so you raise an interesting point on this one, David, because we do see a, a growing number of African Americans who are in communities and in neighborhoods where uh, there aren't large numbers. And I've, I've talked to a number of black parents who have concerns about how do I make sure that my child still feels good about her or himself when it comes to cultural pride and, and understand just what it means to be black in the United States. And I think part of what you cannot do, and, and it pains me to say this, you cannot rely upon schools to do that because by and large schools don't feel like it is their responsibility. Uh, I think schools, generally speaking, do a poor job of really helping to teach and, and instill black uh, pride in, 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 in students. And so I think this is where parents have got to be willing to take those additional steps. And you can do that through a host of different channels. You mentioned that, you know, places like the church, clubs and organizations can all be vital in that regard. But the bottom line is you cannot leave this vital part of the development of our children up to others. Uh, that's our job. That's our responsibility. But I think you have to understand every child is different. And because what happens if you've got this black child who's in a school where it's predominantly white, and he's one of or she's one of only two or three black children, uh, they may not want to be singled out too much because they already feel the pressure and they always feel the, the, the uniqueness of being one of the only as it is. So I can recall many a day when my children were younger in one of these types of settings where they didn't oftentimes see a whole lot of other children who looked like them, that when issues around you know slavery were brought up, they felt you know a little bit awkward at times because they felt like the 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 all the eyes turned to them as if they were somehow the official spokespersons on what it meant to be black. So I think you have to be careful. But the main thing is, I don't think it's off the cuff for parents to approach teachers and say, look, here are some resources that I think you might consider incorporating into your classroom. Here are, here are some pieces of literature that you might think about sharing with your student, because it's not only about instilling black children with that cultural pride in history, but also it's about helping non-black children to understand the, the contributions and the, and the significance of black history. And so it's a twofold, it's a twofold approach that we have to be consistently committed to. When you're in that scenario, um, and uh, certainly we know the statistics about school discipline mm -hmm. uh, around mm -hmm. uh, African American children and Latino children That's as right. well. That's right. Um, children of color in general. Mm -hmm. How do you initiate that conversation and how do you how do you um, create a scenario where you can uh, approach that issue mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. it becoming adversarial because the, yeah. the tendency yeah. is for you know the institution mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. become defensive that's right and of course I would say nobody knows my child better than I do right. so you mm -hmm. can't tell me things about my son you know mm -hmm. that I know to not be true. That doesn't mean that mm -hmm. he can't act out right. side of how he's been trained. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, your children are going to follow mm -hmm. certain things. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you engage? How do you approach that conversation? Yeah. No, I think we're 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 data gatherers, and so part of what the approach has to be first and foremost is I'm going to talk to my child first. I'm going to gather all the data about what happened in a particular situation. Tell me what, when, who, where, why. I need to know all the details before I go talk to any school official. But I know my child, as you said, David, right? And I know what he or she is capable of doing. But I need you to give me all the backdrop. And part of what we don't tend to recognize, our children are, are very perceptive of environment. And they're very keen about the happenings of what goes on. And they do their own data collecting as well. They are constantly watching Who's giving? Who's being given second, third chances? Who's not being given second or third chances? Who's being told that they have a warning versus who's being sent up? So they collect their own data. So the first thing you do is you talk to your child and you find out. Okay, tell me what happened. Who was involved? What you did? 
and why you did it and what the current context is in that particular space, right? And once you have all that information, like I've told my kids, I'm sure you've told your kids, okay, I don't want you to leave out any other piece of information because I don't want to go to that school <laughs> and then find out. Right. You right. have out a key part of the story that is, it is integral to why certain you know, behaviors were enacted in the first place. So I need to get all the data. And then from there, I think it's important and imperative to come and approach a teacher, a principal, a school official, whomever she or he might be, and say, I'm trying to gain clarity on why my child uh, was met with X type of discipline, right? Never in a confrontational or combative mode, but I think you give the person first the opportunity to explain the school policy, the school practice, why they took the steps that they've taken. And then I think you then pre you prepare yourself to, to, to engage in this, in this sort of back and forth. I heard your account of what happened. Here's what my child is telling me that's happened. Uh, I'm curious to see, you know, if you are treating my child any different than how other children are being treated. Because what we know, and the data is abundantly clear, that black children are far more scrutinized, even at the youngest of ages, from as young as kindergarten up to third grade, they are more likely to be suspended, more likely to be expelled, more likely, more likely to be assumed to be cheating, uh, despite the fact that there's no data to suggest that they engage in any kind of misbehavior more than anybody else, but they're punished at a much harsher rate. We got a report coming out on this next week looking at black students, black males in school discipline here in the state of California, and the numbers are just, just mind-blowing. But the bottom line is, yeah, I think that I try to tell parents and caregivers who do this work that if you can like lower the temperature from the outset, that helps. Uh, but I know sometimes that's easier said than done because, mm -hmm. you know, when mom or daddy or whomever finds out that their child is being suspended is in trouble, they're upset. And they want to know, especially if there's a sense that there's an injustice that's been wrong. Uh, and then I think if we really want to go one step deeper, I think it's imperative for us to start asking school officials, let me see your data on who you suspend. You don't have to tell me who those students are by name, but schools have to keep that data. They have to see a breakdown of who they are suspending, who they're expelling by gender, by race, by classroom. And I think that's when you, you the, the rubber meets the road, because then you begin to see, wait a minute, you've got a trend going on here, right? Why is the fact that you've only got 20% of the students in this in this school are African-American, but there's 70% of the kids that you choose to to kick out or suspend or push out. And so I think the data tells the story. So that's why I said we have to constantly be in data gathering mode. But the other key to this is the fact that I think our children are able to pick up on those teachers who have their best interests at heart. Mm -hmm. And I think the more we talk to our children, they'll let you know, this teacher is fair, this teacher is fair. Ah, uh, this one over here, I don't think she really seems to have my best interests at heart. And I think that our children can pick up on that as early as three, four, five years old. They have this ability, like many other children do, to know when they when they feel like their needs are being met. Given some of those challenges that still exist mm -hmm. uh, around that issue, how do we encourage our students to both be hopeful mm -hmm. um, and at the same time to empower them mm -hmm. to to deal with these challenges? Mm -hmm. Because we're we're not. I mean, our, our goal is to raise, yeah. you and I have talked many times, <laughs> to raise independent young people That's right. who know how to handle these things mm -hmm. and, and who in the future are going to be parents as well. That's right. So how do we, how do we take steps to uh, empower them and to create a sense of hope among them when many of the things that they encounter on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis mm -hmm. may not be so positive yeah i mean so this is the dilemma right that's that's the very title here. the dilemma is how do we create a sense of optimism a sense of um, agency in our young people uh how do we help them to believe in themselves how do we help them to believe that hard work pays off how do we help them to real, uh, believe that you know there's opportunities that await them how do we help them to understand all these altruistic things that we want to believe that should exist in a democratic society but then on the other side, tell them, oh, by the way, we also live in a society that's going to look at you through this lens of being a black person. And here are some things that they, they're going to say about you, what they're going to think about you, and some things that they might do to you. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. And I think we have to raise our children with a healthy sense of, of who they are. We've got to build their self-esteem up because we know when they go out in the world out there, there are going to be a lot of things, a lot of people are going to be doing everything in their power to try to take them down a notch or two, right? And so I think we have to constantly have these conversations with our young people, and they never stop. I mean, look, I know you still have these conversations with your sons, right? <laughs> they never stop. They're grown. They got degrees. They're professional. But we're still having the conversations with them because I think it's vital because we understand and we know where they've been, and we understand that that 
You can have college degrees. That doesn't make you exempt from some of this hostility. You can have all kinds of accomplishments. Your paycheck can have, I don't care how many zeros they have after, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and people are still going to see you in certain ways. And so I just think that it's a protective mechanism that we use as parents to try to help protect our children, no matter how old they are, from some of the, the negativity that we know that exists. But I think the antidote to that is building them up speaking to their intellect, speaking to their potential, speaking to their promise, and, and speaking to the way that we know that they can change this world. Um, so moving on with, with a, another series of questions, these mostly revolve again around parenting. Mm -hmm. um, one of the parents asked, um, says, I, I am an educator and father of two black boys. My wife and I have felt like we were asked to either raise our children mm -hmm. in a suburb where there are few, if any, families that look like ours, mm -hmm. or in neighborhoods that tend to be in high crime areas mm -hmm. or urban populations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we want our children to be both comfortable around people who look like them and to share a common history with this country and with those who don't. My question is, can my wife and I raise our, where, excuse me, where can my wife wow. and I raise our children <laughs> where there is a thriving middle class, wow. family oriented community wow. that is uh, diverse with a large black population? Wow. And she probably, or he left out affordable too, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you changed the question, right? Can, can I find it as opposed to where can I find it? It's a very different set of circumstances, right? So again, here is the dilemma. And this is the dilemma. I cannot tell you how many African-American families have, have, have faced, you know, for some time, right? I want to be able to provide for my children something better than what I had growing up, right? And I want my children to be in a safe environment that's going to be, um, you know, nurturing and warm and all the things that any family wants for their, their children, whether you're white, black, Asian, you know, Native American, Latino. Um, but I want them to be able to not be the outcast or the other, right? And I think we have a challenge here in California. The challenge is that we are not, we are not as densely located or situated here in, in, in California, by and large, and in Los Angeles in particular, as you might find in other cities and states across the country. So you have this 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 disbursement of, of African American families in some some parts of LA and in, in, in the Lamert Park area. You've got, you know, you go east out to the Inland Empire, you got some pockets there, you go out north to the Enlo Valley, you got some which we're, we're sprinkled all over the place. So because of that, that means you have very little critical mass uh, components. So every parent has got a, a, a dilemma on her or his hands, and they've got to make decisions about what is it that I choose? Do I put my child in the school where there are more children who look like them, but the quality may not be what I think it should or could be, and my child is not academically where I want them to be. Or conversely, it's a situation where if I put them in a more academically rigorous site, uh, they're one of only two or three black children. Now I'm concerned about some of the cultural development of my child. I don't know that there's any other group of people other than black folks who face that dilemma as intensely and as persistently as we do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that many white families have that same challenge. I don't think the, 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 that very many Asian families have that same challenge. I think Latino families may face some of that, but I think because of the sheer numbers of, of, of black folk here in Los Angeles in particular, LA County, it's even more uh, of an acute challenge. And so uh, I wish I could list off a name of places, <laughs> but uh, I'm oftentimes at a loss myself. There are pockets in places like Pasadena, uh, Sherman Oaks, uh, even as you go further east, you, 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 there are pockets uh, there as well. But every area is still going to require parents to be involved and parents to be active and parents to be participatory. Because even if you find a situation where there are folks who look like you, it doesn't always mean that folks are doing right by your children. Mm -hmm. And that's the message I would send the, to parents over and over again, that no matter what the folks in charge look like, white, red, blue, green, or red, your presence matters. And you've got to be the biggest, loudest, most present advocate at all times because oftentimes, uh, again, I say this as an educator, many schools don't always do right on behalf of certain children. Mm -hmm. Let me switch for just, just one, one, one moment to a, another thing that I think parents struggle with. I, we certainly struggle with this in our house. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little older than you are, so mm -hmm. I remember when we had pay phones rather than cell phones. <laughs> right. uh, I remember pay phones. <laughs> but um, 
some parents are asking, how do they successfully balance the use of technology mm -hmm. um, with a, a healthy appreciation for um, the outdoors and, and mm -hmm. all other kinds of social interactions mm -hmm. um, that aren't driven by technology? Yeah. And that, you know, technology is, is great. You, you were talking about this before we started. Um, in terms of giving access to information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But access to information can cut both ways, That's right? right? I mean, right. it can mm -hmm. be a real positive, mm -hmm. um, but just because your kids can access information <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean that you want them That's to, right? right? That's right. That's right. And, and I think particularly with social media today, mm -hmm. the explosion of social media and the accessibility of social media, um, there's uh, really a more unfettered access that's in some right. ways that's to right. your children yeah, that's right. and, and access that you and I remember when my son um, we were talking about social media he was talking about his face about Facebook mm -hmm. and talking about you know he had 600 friends yeah about yeah, 700 yeah, friends. yeah yeah and we had to go into this long discussion about what what a friend <laughs> a friend <laughs> right. really is that's right, right? That's right. and uh, but, but how, what would you share with parents about that? Because I, when my kids were coming up, um, I think they were among the last kids yeah. to get a cell phone. Um, yeah. and, and, and actually, it was more out of necessity yeah. than yeah. a desire to have them That's connected right. because you know, we were commuting. You know, right. Many parents That's here right. in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. certainly, you commute. Mm -hmm. You need to know where your That's child right. is That's and right. when yeah. they are, where yeah. they are. Yeah. That's okay. Can you yeah, I mean, this is a this is a, another challenge. My wife and I struggled with this for a very long time. When was the right age for our children to have cell phones? We were a lot like you all were in that we felt like we would rather do it later than sooner. Uh, and part of the issue was our kids became, you know, curious as to mom, dad, everybody else has them. Why can't we have them? We always came back to the rule: we don't do what everybody else does. We do what's best for this household. <laughs> and so, but then, then you begin to realize the need to be connected to your children, especially when they're younger, right? Um, and so, I think we have to be constantly vigilant about making sure we monitor what our children are consuming on these devices. Uh, I got parents who will tell me, "Well, I don't want to invade his or her privacy." To that, I say, "Well, who's paying the bill? You or the child, right?" So, as long as you are paying that bill, you got right. To and access to that thing at any time without any kind of prior notice, right? I just think we've got to get involved. We got to watch. We got to listen. We got to ask. We got to say, let me see that phone. Open up. Let me see who you're texting. Let me see who you're communicating with via Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is. We just got to be in their stuff, right? Now, are they going to like it? Of course not, right? But we're not trying to be friends with our children. We're trying to raise them, right? So I think there's a fine line there. But then I think we also have to have these, these approaches where we say, you know what? All the technology is going to stop and be shut off at a certain hour. So at 8 o'clock, I know a family where all the cell phones not go. At the dinner table. <laughs> yeah, definitely not at the dinner table. At the dinner table, we're going to sit down. We're all going to have this thing called conversation. I don't know if you've heard of it before, right? <laughs> and we're going to actually talk to people and have eye-to-eye -eye contact, face-to-face -face, uh, uh, interaction. And I just think we have to we have to understand that, yes, we live in an information um, 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 yeah, world. Technology is here to stay. It's a big part of what our young people do. But it doesn't have to control them. It doesn't have to take away from family time. I think it's, some, it's also important to tell children, okay, we're going to put the phones down. We're going to go out for a walk, mm -hmm. the entire family. Right? We're going to get outside and walk, and we're going to do things that are really helpful for all of us. And so I think we have to be very much mindful of that. And then let me also add this final point on this point. I think we have to watch ourselves as adults in terms of how much we're consuming it because a lot of this is learned behavior. We're always attached to our devices. That child at, at, at six months old is watching us and they're thinking, okay, this is what we do because I see dad doing it. I see mom doing it. And so therefore they start mimicking the same thing. And one of the things that always frustrates me and just really sad me is to go to dinner. And I saw this a couple of months ago, my wife and I were watching the family with six of them at the table, mom and a dad and four kids. And for about 15, 20 minutes, they all were here, right? I'm thinking, that is just lost opportunity, right? The waiter came, they looked up, and they said that, they're, I'm like, why even go to dinner or sit at the table together if everybody's on their devices and you can't even have a conversation with your own family members across the table? So I just think we have to reel it in, monitor it, be mindful of it, check ourselves on it, get out and do some things like talk, walk, enjoy family. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, it, it is, you know, I. I talk to my children about this. I've talked to my children about this a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, 
one of the things that I always shared with them goes back to kind of the safety issue. Right? Mm -hmm. I told mm -hmm. them less about privacy and more about safety. Yeah. Um, even now, you know, my, my youngest mm -hmm. son is mm -hmm. 23 years old, mm -hmm. and when he comes home to visit, and his friends, of course, are all over, and he, you know, we live in Chino Hills, he wants to be in LA, mm -hmm. hanging out with his friends. And I always ask the question, so if something happened to you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the yeah. police came to 1412 yeah. and asked, Mr. Morgan, so when did you last see your son? Yeah. Or where was your son yeah. last? Yeah. I, I'm not trying to get in your space right. about That's who right. you're with That's and what right. you're doing, but wouldn't it sound a little crazy to be able to say, well, the last I saw him, he was driving a white Prius and yeah. headed down to 63 yeah. Yeah. in Los Angeles. <laughs> That's, That's all I know, right? right? That's, right. That's right. all we have to go on. So, you know, I, I think uh, sometimes as parents, we have to kind of shift the focus That's right. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and help them understand what our real concern mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. them. And that we always have, we always have the best interest That's at right. heart. We, That's right. That's we, right. We may not always express it in a way that is clear to them That's at right. the time. That's right. That's right. Because That's I've right. found that my, I think I've become a smarter father yeah. <laughs> uh, as my children have gotten older. We went through some very serious rough spots yeah, with that, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, I have yeah. become a, a little better at that. Mm -hmm. um, your uh, BMI movement has mm -hmm. also sparked another class here on campus mm -hmm. called mm -hmm. Sister to Sister. Right. And this, this next question kind of goes to that, and uh, this, this parent asks, how can black women be an ally and partner with dismantling the dangerous social cultural construct between wife, mother, and mm. being family. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, this is where we got to go back and do our history lesson. So when we do our history lesson, we see that black women have always been um, part of the foundation of what black life in these United States of America has looked like, right? You know, I mean, our mothers, our grandmothers, our, our great aunts have always been integral to our struggle here. And so I think today is no different. I think black women have to be at the forefront, along with black men, of how we tackle these complex problems, right? And I learned that quickly when we had the BMI movement taking place. I had black women here on this campus who said, well, Dr. Howard, what about us? Uh, we need love. We need support, which I completely agree with, right? I just felt like it wasn't my role or my job as a black man to, to lead that charge, if you will, but I was willing to do whatever I could to help support it. Uh, but I do think, I think what we have to have black women do, and under, first of all, I think black men need to understand the unique types of challenges that black women go through. Mm. Uh, I think we need to understand that patriarchy is real. Uh, these issues of sexual assault, sexual violence are real. Uh, we, we have some ugly parts of our, 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 our circumstance we don't like to talk about. Uh, domestic uh, uh, violence is, is very rampant in black communities and black families. Um, we can't say we want to eradicate racism but then turn around and not want to deal with issues of sexism and sexual assault and sexual violence. So we have to, A, as black men, own up and recognize some of the challenges that our black women face that sometimes is a direct result of what we do. That's the hard part, right? But then as much as we ask that of ourselves, which I think is where we should start, we also need black women to understand the unique experiences that black men go through in society. And that despite the fact that it's a, a patriarchal society, there's still some, 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 some challenges that are unique to our experiences. And so I think black women men understand that, but I think they need to continue to hear our struggles, hear our pain, hear our frustration, hear our voices. And I will also say this, uh, I love the way I see black women and black mothers uh, love their sons uh, and, and nurture their sons. But but at the same time, I always say this, and I know this is going to get some folks a little bit bothered by this, but you cannot say that you want that son, that child, to become a man and then, then not always be satisfied with what you see his father doing in terms of helping to bring him up, right? Uh, I think sometimes I think black mothers oftentimes can um, enable their sons in ways that I think are not healthy for their development. So I think we all have to understand that that we're in this together, we're, we're, we're co-parenting, we're, we're raising children together, and we want them all, our daughters and our sons, to be the best that they can be. But there are different ways that these different vices in our society play, and they work against them. And if we're not careful, we'll be pitted against each other, uh -huh. and then when that happens, our <laughs> children lose. <laughs> totally, totally. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, about uh, our our students, our children, um, and trying to uh, help them be prepared for mm -hmm. this world mm -hmm. um, that you know is 
frequently alienating. Um, but one of the questions that was raised, I, I think is a really good question, is um, this, this parent asked, how do we promote friendships or more inclusive peer groups um, for our students uh, in communities that are largely segregated by race, mm -hmm. since we know that knowing about different backgrounds and other people is essential to conflict resolution right. and to developing right. healthy relationships. That's right. So the challenge with that is this, is that we have all kinds of data that shows that black children in particular are much more likely to seek and to be accepting of cross-racial friendships than other children are. But we, what we also know is that Black children are oftentimes most likely to be left out of those cross-racial relationships and dynamics. And so herein lies our challenge, right? Our children tend to be, uh, again, generally speaking, more receptive, more open, more inviting to cross-racial friendships, despite the fact that they oftentimes find themselves in social circles where they're being pushed aside. That's why one of the things I oftentimes tell parents is that you've got to listen to what your children are telling you because mm -hmm. children are experiencing things that you know you may not know that they're I mean, I talk to my children now and they're in their 20s and they're telling us about things they experienced years ago. I'm thinking, well, why didn't you tell us, right? We could have done something, we could have helped. But I think what happens for some of our children, they come to accept these acts of exclusion, these acts of discrimination, these acts of racism as just normal practice. Mm -hmm. And as my son told me a couple of months ago, he said, Dad, if we were to tell you the things that were happening, you or mom would have been up at the school every day for something, right? Mm -hmm. And my thing was, okay, then let us be at the school every day, right? Mm -hmm. But I think we have to understand that social dynamics are real. Social dynamics also are, are sort of clouded by these learned behaviors that children have that come from the wider society, from media, from parents, from home. And so in many ways, black children can easily be positioned or seen as the other. We don't want him or her in our space. They're seen as the other in the classroom. They're seen as the bad kid, as the misbehaving kid, whatever the labels might be. And so I think we have to talk to our children about how to navigate those uncomfortable situations. We have to talk to school officials about how they can keep their close eye on making sure that they, they foster uh, cross collaborative kinds of friendships and social interactions. Uh, but we also have to listen and watch to our children because they are oftentimes telling us things that we may not be sensitive to as well. You know, I, I, um, I grew up in a, as I mentioned, I grew up in a small town. Mm -hmm. um, but as I grew up also, I, I began to recognize that there, there were and are, mm -hmm. continue to be, mm -hmm. um, people who are genuine allies, genuine mm -hmm. friends. That's right. Right? That don't look like me. That's right. Um, That's right. You know, um, two of my mentors, two of my, my strongest mentors in high school, mm -hmm. um, one was a Jewish math teacher mm -hmm. who was mm -hmm. raised in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the mm -hmm. other was a, a short uh, elderly white lady mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. was, whose father was friends with FDR mm -hmm. and who uh, taught journalism. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so our, our and, and I'm sure, you know, you just look at UCLA and the mm -hmm. campus and, mm -hmm. and people mm -hmm. in your department that's right. that you work with right. on campus all that's the right. time. How do we um, help empower them? Mm -hmm. um, and I think for parents who are raising children in schools, mm -hmm. uh, this, this was a question that was asked, how do we help to empower and develop relationships <clears throat> or model relationships so that our children can mm -hmm. see um, that not everybody mm -hmm. who doesn't look like mm -hmm. you is the end. That's right. Right? Yeah. That, that yeah. there are people here, and that some of these people are, are going to be crucial to your success. That's right. That's right. Not because of what they look like, not mm -hmm. because of their privilege, mm -hmm. but simply by virtue of who they are. That's person. right. No, I think you're spot on with this, David. And, and I, I, I would echo your sentiment that my personal and professional career has been aided by a lot of folks who did not look like me. And this is one of the things we talk to our young men here on campus about that you, you have to recognize that mentorship and support comes in all different shapes, sizes, colors, and gender. And you have to put yourself in a position to be open to that and to receive that, right? Because at the end of the day, you have to be able to kind of look at how do people see you as a human being? How do they view you as a person that tells you they have your best interest at heart? And conversely, and this is the part that's painful to sometimes come to grips with, sometimes folks who do look like you mm -hmm. do not have your best interest at heart, right? right? So you can't just continually go through life trying to align yourself only with folks who look like you because you will miss out on tremendous opportunity for lifelong partnerships and friendships and at the same time, you can be hurt by those who may not always have your best interest at heart. So I think the biggest way we do that is we have to model it, right? And mm -hmm. so our kids look at who are our friends. They look at who do we socialize with, who do we confide in. And I think we can talk it 
uh, up as much as we can. But at the end of the day, our kids are watching us, right? Uh, who is dad's, you know, circle of friends? Who does mom talk to a lot, right? When we're in the neighborhood, does she speak to people who are, who, are, who look different? I just think we have to talk to our young people about the fact that that, that we look. We live in a world where race matters. I'm never going to dismiss that, right? It, it has always matters. It still matters today. But at the end of the day, I oftentimes say, while we're members of different races, we're also still members of the same race, which is the human race. And there's a human connection that bonds us all that we sometimes get lost in remembering. And I think we have to understand those connections. There are people who uh, may not look like you, but have far more in common with you than folks who do look like you. Uh, there are circumstances and adversities that you may have experienced that somebody who you would never think has experienced something similar has gone through as well, and you've got a bond there. So I always think that we have to put ourselves in position to say, uh, how do we learn and grow from the myriad of human experiences that exist uh, on, on this planet? And we can't shut ourselves off from any of these opportunities because that might be a loss for us that, that we may come to regret. So I think we have to help our young people and our older people understand that friendships mm -hmm. come in all colors, like I said, uh, mentorships, all ages. all ages, right. You just have to be receptive to it because you never know what you're missing out on. So for, for some of those, those our friends and um, some of those people who want to be our friends who mm -hmm. um, haven't quite been able to get there, maybe, maybe it's their upbringing, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe mm -hmm. their, their parents weren't as progressive yes. in their thinking yes. about yes. Um, about race and culture. Mm -hmm. um, how do we uh, encourage them to? Because you know, their their first encounter, their first effort to mm -hmm. help someone who doesn't look like them may not go. That's right. You know, That's right. the best. Right. How yep. do we how do we encourage them both in terms of students and also in terms of parents? Because That's right. uh, you know. Even if you go to a school that's predominantly black mm -hmm, or Latino, mm -hmm. not likely that most of the teachers are going to go to black or that's Latino. Right, so, right. yeah. um, how do we how do we encourage folks? Yeah, I think the one thing I, I tell folks is number one, you can't you can't oversell it. You can't you can't be overzealous in your efforts to somehow befriend or support someone who is African American or Latino or whatever the group might be. I think at the end of the day, you've got to be your authentic self, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's your best bet. And your authentic self is going to ultimately shine through. And it's going to either radiate and, and, and draw you in connection with folks, or it's going to push them away. But I think your authentic self has got to be one where you are not trying to, 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 to work too hard and try to prove your commitment or prove your your, your, your alliance with any particular member or members of a group. And I always say that the thing that helps best for me is if you ask questions, learn, don't assume that you know who I am or what my experiences are or what my background is. So engage, you know, query, uh, question, uh, but also be willing to share some of yourself as well. This is about how you build rapport relationships. And I think you do that by listening and learning. And don't assume that I'm just like the black guy that you knew from another place a year ago, right? Me and that black guy can be as night and day as they come, right? So I think it's a matter of not making these gross generalizations, uh, not buying into these stereotypes about who you think I am. But it's about getting to know me. And, and the more you get to know me, you then know if I'm willing to open up and let you in or if I'm not comfortable with that. A lot of folks are just very leery of anybody who's yeah. not right. <laughs> and like, I just don't, I don't trust you and I don't know if I should trust you. It's going to take a while before I let you in. And if you think it's worth the hassle, you'll keep coming back. If you don't, you'll go someplace else. That's fine, too. Uh, so for those folks who teach African-American students, if they're not African-American, I always say, look, it's, it's, it's a process. It's about trust. Uh, it's about respect. Uh, it's about transparency. Uh, it's about honesty. Uh, it's about dependability, right? Are you going to do the thing that you say you're going to do, right? Uh, are you who you say that you are, right? Uh, do I trust you, right? Um, it's, it's, about, it's about respect. And respect is you got to give it to get it. Uh, it's all these factors that we know are critical to just human interactions in general. And I think that connecting with black children, black adults, is really no, no different, right? We, we, we hurt and we get cut and we're vulnerable and we're uh, offended like anybody else. And so don't treat us as if we're somehow a different species altogether. Recognize that there are a lot of folks across the racial spectrum who are just leery of anybody. And sometimes we're the same way. I think when black folks do it sometimes, we're looked at as being dismissive and you know, aloof and arrogant. But yet, still, other folks can do it, and they're just discerning. And I'm saying it's the same behavior, but it gets looked at differently. Yeah, I, I'm, my favorite line to the students that I mentor and to my, my children is, give people a chance to prove who they are. There you go. There you right. go. <laughs> I mean, in the end, that, in the end mm -hmm. that ultimately wins out. That's right. You, you know, 
you give people an opportunity to improve mm -hmm. mm -hmm. over time and improve mm -hmm. their engagement, who they are, you will ultimately see that's right. whether the interest is genuine that's and, right. and what, what they're committed that's to. Right. We want to thank you for participating with us today. We're not finished yet, um, but we, we do have a little time to take some questions. And one of the questions that's uh, come up to us is, uh, uh, Professor Howard, is in what ways can we address teachers' low expectations of African American children that are used that are used to more affluent areas and receive more rigorous education? Yes, that's a big one. That's a big. One. We could do a whole show just on that one alone, right? So, to look, so here's the mistake that I think a lot of African American families make. Um, we move to a new community, it's better schools, it's better neighborhoods, so therefore my child's getting a better education. Not always the case. Um, like I said earlier, you still have to be involved, you still have to be present, you still have to be participatory because what tends to happen is that as the, 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 the person's question speaks to is that we know from all types of data that oftentimes African American students uh, have lower expectations held for them by white teachers by Asian American teachers, by Latino teachers, and here's the kicker, David, even by African American teachers. So African American students oftentimes walk into classrooms where they're more than likely, in some cases, to have a teacher who just doesn't hold them as accountable, just doesn't have the same kind of expectations, they're more likely to give them a remedial curriculum. So if that's the case, this is where you as a teacher, I mean, you as a parent has, has got to be one who's willing to go in and watch that teacher, serve that teacher, Communicate with that teacher. One of the things I would always do with my children at the beginning of the year, I said, what are your expectations for my student, my child at the end of the year? I just want to know, what's your vision for him or her? I need to hear you say it in front of me, in front of my child, so we all make sure we're on the same page, right? Uh, and then again, I put a lot of stock in what my children say. Uh, I believe my children are going to be straight shooters. They're going to tell me what the real deal is. And I remember one year, um, years ago, my son was second grade. He came home and said, Dad, my teacher doesn't like me. This is like the second, third day of school. I'm thinking, why would a child six years old come home and say, my teacher doesn't like me, right? And I said, why did you say that? He said, because I'm sitting all in the back. She never calls me when I raise my hand. She, I, I get up to put something in the trash can. My name goes on the board. Other kids, put, they get up to do things. and then So he had all this data that he had gathered at six years old, right? And he was clear. Now, I think oftentimes our kids may not know how to be as explicit at stating that, but they get this sixth sense that, you know what, she doesn't seem to care for me the way that she cares for these other students here, right? And I think the goal is that we want our kids to feel like they're being treated with the same love, dignity, respect, care, and nurturance as other students are. I and mean, they don't feel that they know it, right? And sometimes in an attempt to get that, they may begin to act out or talk out or, quote, unquote, misbehave. But I just think that to the question, I think we have to make sure as parents that you're active, that you're present, that you're participatory. Uh, and if you're not satisfied, if there's doubt, you go and you have a conversation with that teacher. If that doesn't get you what you need or want, you have a conversation with that principal. If that doesn't get what you want, you need to have a working relationship with the school board members. You need to be even be prepared to go one step further to have a working relationship with the superintendent of the district. So if you don't get what you want, you know the proper channels to go through to get it. I just think that my grandmother always said, closed mouth doesn't get fed, right? And so if you sit back quietly and you don't say anything, you're not going to get what you need and want for your children. And this is why this one is so important, because here's the point that I stress all the time, David. When it comes to children's education, we don't get a do-over. We right. get one time to get this thing right. right. And it pains me to talk to parents who, when they look back, they're saying, I wish I had done this or that or the other more. Or adults who say, I wish someone would have advocated for me in ways that would have perhaps given me more opportunity. I think that we've got to be just steadfast in our belief that our children are just as bright, just as you know, intelligent, just as creative as any other group of students. We have to help schools recognize that brilliance. We have to help teachers see their potential. We have to have administrators see their promise. And sometimes th that doesn't happen. And I don't maintain that's always done with, in, with, you know, with intent. I maintain that sometimes you have the nicest, the sweetest, kindest people who are doing the most damage and most destruction to children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer in see your child's environment. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. In my school district, I was known as the parent who would show up without an appointment. There you go. <laughs> so just and not not interfere with the classroom, mm -hmm. but just to have an opportunity to mm -hmm. observe mm -hmm. what happened in the context of the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, not only with my child but with mm -hmm. other children. Mm -hmm. um, because my love as an educator is, mm -hmm. is around children. That's right. Period, that's right. right? That's and right. 
I think love, love for children wins out in the end. That's right. And we know this too, David, on that point. This is not only helpful for your child, but the data says that parents who are more involved, their children do better across the board academically. They do better socially, emotionally. They do better in life when we're more involved. We really appreciate our time with you. Um, for those of you who are uh, who are still on, um, just wanted to let you know that we're going to be sending out um, some resources for you, uh, some websites that you can connect to. There's some really fantastic websites out there um, that can connect you with different kinds of programs to help you as a parent, um, different kinds of programs that speak to the things that you want for your children. Uh, one website that I was particularly impressed with was uh, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Uh, they actually break down by state um, who different funders are and what kinds of projects they're funding in that individual state. Um, and it doesn't really matter where you are. These things are all over the country. They're, they're, they're localized, um, but they really are happening nationally in D.C. Um, there's the D.C. Tutor Mentor Org. Um, UCLA is a part of a, a program called SMASH, mm -hmm. the science, summer, excuse me, summer Math and Science mm -hmm. Honors Program, mm -hmm. which is supported out of a foundation mm -hmm. in Oakland and is, is national. Um, the Institute for Responsible Leadership, mm -hmm. which is located in D.C. and mm -hmm. brings mm -hmm. students uh, mm -hmm. to D.C. for a six-week mm -hmm. internship. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of opportunities that you have to be invested in doing the research, Amen. gathering the Amen. data, <laughs> as we've uh, heard so much mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. uh, in order to, uh, to see that those opportunities come to fruition. I want to thank you for joining us. This is uh, the first uh, in a series on parenting in the 21st century that Diversity Programs and Alumni Affairs is going to be hosting. Uh, we will be getting additional information out to you about the other topics. Or if you have a topic um, that you'd like to suggest to us, uh, please email me at dmorgan at support.ucla.edu, and we'd be happy to take that under consideration. Thank you for joining us today, and we wish you all the best, and uh, love your children. Give them a hug today.